Hello, welcome everyone. And uh, well, I'll, I'll be honest, at first I thought it would be great starting paper presentation at Movisys, but then I realized, oh no, I have to follow Fogel's uh, fantastic talk. That's gonna be impossible, but I'm gonna give it a go. Uh, I'm gonna talk about my work, Fab Toys Plus Toys with large arrays of uh, fabric-based pressure sensors to enable fine-grained interaction uh, detection. Uh, children spend three to four hours a day on average playing with their toys. This creates a great opportunity for us to implement applications where they can uh, improve their motor skills by engaging them physically and uh, they, so they can have a growth and uh, potentially uh, diagnose some illnesses. They can also, we can also implement applications where they can improve their cognitive skills, where, where they can solve problems using their creativity, imaginations, and sequence memorizing. We can also implement applications for social uh, improvement where they can care for the toy and receive feedbacks uh, based on their behavior. But um, is this possible with today's technology? Uh, to, if you look closely at what's uh, today present at the market as a smart toy, they're more mainly rigid-based electronic uh, toys. Uh, the reason behind that is the current pressure sensing technology is mainly rigid electronic sensors or they're limited in flexibility, they're point sensors, or even just uh, tiny push buttons, binary push buttons, uh, which uh, typically fails to detect uh, inter interactions with the toy, or they change the feel and look of the toy, as you can see. What we propose is using fabric-based sensing. The reason behind that is we can sense an area using a single sensor, we can change the dimension of the sensor to conform to the area that's supposed to sense, uh, we can tune the sensing so that it can pick up small and uh, like uh, very strong pressure sensing as well. Uh, the sensors are gonna be flexible and conforming so they can maintain the feel and uh, the look of the toy. And they are mechanically more durable than rigid electronics. As a result, this uh, array of these textile sensors can um, uh, turn and enable sensing for any fabric-based objects. The pressure sensor we have in mind in this work is a novel sensor structure we developed here in our group. It can be summarized as two silver uh, fabrics, conductive fabrics, sandwiching a middle layer cotton. The sensor uh, performs by changing the changes in the pressure into, um, into changes in the resistance by improving, increasing the number of charge carrying paths and reducing their effective length. As a result, those two uh, conductive layers on either side can monitor the changes in the pressure applied on the fabric. We use an array of these fabric sensors to turn an ordinary teddy bear into a sensing platform, which we call Fabtoy. To have a wide area of coverage, we added 24 sensors underneath the felt, placed strategically around the toy. We needed wide dynamic range to detect very tiny, uh, weak uh, signals, as well as very strong uh, grasping of the toy. And to detect these uh, tiny uh, pressure changes, we needed to amplify those pressure signals. This design choice effectively doubles the number of analog channels from 24 to 48 channels. And just to give, a, give you a better idea of why we need to amplify the channels, here is uh, a sample of the signal showing that tickling session uh, with amplified and non-amplified channels shown. And as you can see, the non-amplified channels during the tickling session is very small. And considering the fact that the ADCs used in these low power scenarios are typically 10 to 12 bits, we might actually miss the signals because they might go down beneath the noise floor. Which is why we amplified the channels to get the red plus you can see, which is clearly uh, telling you what's happening over there. And as a result of this design choice, we have analog multiplexer to turn these 48 analog channels into eight, which can then be read by our microcontroller. Now to give you an idea about the hardware design, we have to first sense and read the sensors. And to do that, we need to model the sensors uh, to with uh, resistors in parallel with the capacitor. Now to read the changes in the uh, basically pressure, we uh, monitor the resistance changes because that's, that's much more uh, sensitive. We add one resistance in series, uh, effectively making a voltage divider. Now the output voltage now represents the pressure applied on the fabric. This is going to be the uh, hardware design, 24 sensors followed by 24 voltage dividers, 24 voltage buffers to um, negate the effect of load on the sensors, and uh, filtering and amplification for all the stages. Now the 48 channels 
are then being fed to analog multiplexer controlled by the microcontroller we have on board to periodically read all these 48 channels and transmit through Bluetooth low energy. Now, after we make such a platform, we discover some unique challenges uh, to the fabric-based sensing. The first one is crosstalk. Now, the crosstalk in these specific domains, we named it crosstalk because fabric-based pressure sensors are double-sided. What it means is that they can monitor the intended external pressure changes as well as internal pressure changes, which is coming from the stuffing inside the toy. As a result, the f these fabric-based pressure sensor sensors can detect interactions happening with the adjacent sensors as well. There is uh, an example that's shown is, uh, in this uh, graph here. It shows a swiping session followed by a swiping chest followed by a swiping stomach. And the swiping chest, you can see the chest and the stomach sensor both picking up the signals. But this, when we swipe the stomach, only the stomach uh, sensor picks up the signal, which means we have crosstalk, but the, even the crosstalk is not symmetric. It's asymmetric crosstalk. The next challenge we face uh, when we talk about fabric-based sensors is hysteresis. This gets worse in, uh, in context of a plush toy because uh, the first, the stuffing inside the plush toy is uh, they have physical hysteresis, which means they take some time to go back to their original state. In addition, fabric-based uh, sensors, they tend to innately go back to the original state after a short delay, which causes this plot that you see here, which shows 700 seconds of experiment where we grasp and release left hand of the toy, and as you can see, the uh, sensor response is changing over time. So we had to develop neural network model that can actually uh, challenge and tackle these challenges uh, effectively. In, uh, in data analytics pipeline, we considered both cases of local processing as well as remote processing. The blocks inside the solid line shows blocks implemented inside the toy, and inside the dashed line are the blocks that we implemented uh, outside on a remote machine for processing assistance. Uh, the data analytics pipeline starts with uh, pre-processing, which may includes uh, f some digital filtering and data segmentation. Then we have signal processing trigger. The main objective of signal processing trigger block, block is to detect idle states um, and uh, effectively uh, terminating the process to save power consumption. Then we have resampling to reduce the uh, sampling rate. Then we choose between local and remote. And in both cases, we have five layers of neural networks but the difference is that in local, we have early exit blocks implemented to terminate the process faster to save power consumption. And in the remote processing, we have autoencoder implemented to compress the data to save power consumption for BLE transmission. Now let's go in block by block, let's explain the power saving al algorithms we use in FabToy. The first one is wake up trigger. Wake up trigger block, as I mentioned earlier, is a way of detecting the idle states faster and with a very uh, negligible power consumption. The, we empirically found out that the sum of the standard deviations across amplified channels gives us a reliable idea about the presence of an interaction across the toy. Then this metric is compared with the dynamic threshold shown here to find and, uh, the existence of an uh, interaction. Please note that we could use IMUs inside the toy to find out if there's anything happening outside. But the problem there is, the, again, the stuffing of the toy physically filter out the very small uh, minuscule movements uh, outside. So it would uh, result in a large number of false, uh, false negatives. The next block is the local neural network model. And as I um, described earlier, the goal of this neural network model is to de detect interactions efficiently. And to do that, we note that most of the times, at the earlier stages of the neural network, network, the result is already determined. So by exiting earlier than intended, we can save a huge amount of power consumption. And uh, these early blocks and the effect, this trade-off between power consumption and accuracy is something I'm going to show you at the evaluations. The next one is a remote neural network model. For the remote case, the bottleneck for power consumption is uh, wireless transmission. Uh, no surprises there. And to reduce the power consumption there, we implement autoencoder. The autoencoder compresses the data 
and we studied this compression from the, from the rate of one, which means no compression, up to the rate of 12, which means, like as uh, example shown below, we can have 48 uh, channels down to four streams of data. This data is then reconstructed in the decoder in the assisting uh, machine, which can be a smartphone. And then we, we use the same five-layer neural network to do the machine learning, but there is no early exits anymore here because we, don't, we are not limited with the power anymore. Which brings me to the implementations in Faptoid. As you can see on the uh, figure on the left, we have the sensors placed underneath the felts of the toy. We have conductive threads to route all of these sensors to the PCB shown in the middle. The PCB, PCB's major components are listed in the table, and analog multiplexers, uh, op amps, and uh, regulators are all chosen to be ultra low power. For the microcontroller, we chose NRF52 family, which um, is relatively low power, has a reasonable amount of uh, computational resources, and has DLA stack implemented inside. For our evaluations, we asked 18 participants to spend 16 minutes with our toy. Now, this action-packed 16 minutes consists of 37 single interactions followed by 65 complex interactions. Complex interactions in case of Fab Toy means interacting with the toy with both hands, each hand performing a different interaction. On uh, considering idle state, we have 103 total labels for our, micro, uh, for our classifiers to figure out what's going on. And um, please note that we did these evaluations and did this project in the peak of COVID. It wasn't really easy to get an IRB approval for uh, children, uh, studying with children, but we, are, we know the importance of uh, actually doing this project and studying the effect on children. So our group is actively pursuing collaboration with uh, psychology experts to move this project forward and see the effects on children. Now let's see the evaluations and how FabToy performs. The first evaluations I want to share with you guys is the overall performance and the effect of reducing the spatial granularity on the uh, accuracy. When at the, at the base case, at the most, um, with most resolution, the spatial resolution, we have 24 sensors as, uh, as a result, 24 locations, and the accuracy is around 83% uh, 80, uh, for complex interaction and 86% for single interactions. But as we reduce the uh, spatial granularity to eight locations by merging the adjacent sensors and down to four locations, accuracy is gonna, uh, uh, of course, improve up to 93 and 94%. The next evaluation is comparing our model in FabToy with alternate models. And uh, we compared the model we used in FabToy with MLP, XGBoost, Random Forest, and K-Nearest Neighbor. And as you can see, the model outperforms the uh, well-known models. The next evaluation I'm gonna show you is the amplified versus non-amplified version, which is basically telling us was it really necessary to have amplified version as well? Uh, the answer is uh, yeah, if you count 5% uh, effective. So we, uh, we increased 5% accuracy by merging the amplified and non-amplified information. Next, let's uh, do a check on the benchmarking local and remote model. Do a uh, check the study of this uh, trade-off between uh, power consumption and accuracy by tuning these uh, power saving uh, models. For the local model, as we exit earlier in our neural network model, we can uh, reduce the processing latency by the factor of two while reducing the accuracy from 86% to 82%. For the remote model, we have the similar story. By uh, tuning the factoring of the outside encoder from one, which means no compression, and the accuracy comes from 86 to 78%, but will save uh, power consumption, again, the factor of two. And the combination of these two plus shown in the bottom right figure. And as you can see, for both cases, our power saving algorithms uh, can save power consumption by order of two. The thing is that that's really important to note when designing such a platform is the execution latency, which means whether, we are, whether or not we're able to actually execute in real time. For us, execution happens every one second for a window of three seconds. So our execution latency across the pipeline should be less than one second, which is in case of NRF, which is the slowest of these competitors, of course, but it is still fast enough and can do the job in 250 milliseconds. Next, we broke down the processing power in six different scenarios, three remote and three local. For the three remote and three locals, we tuned the power saving 
for the remotes with tuning the autoencoder for the uh, local by exiting earlier in the neural network model. As you can see, we can uh, always say also 50% power consumption by going, choosing the tuning factor. I want to conclude my talk by um, uh, telling you that the sensor fabrics are the most sensible and most suitable add-ons to our current plush toys to enable them into smart sensing platform because they are flexible, they are washable, they are robust. However, fabric sensors are noisy and they, they may require large uh, interface to actually, large, surf large surface to actually be able to sense large surfaces, which means we need uh, optimized machine learning models, we might need large number of uh, sensors, and we might need to amplify all those channels to pick up uh, the tiny signals. But doing all this together, we get the imperceptible longitudinal sensing for our plush toys, we can implement many interesting applications with the toys. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be taking questions now. Thank you.